So welcome to Will Butler Adams, uh, who runs Brompton Bikes, which uh, is just a wonderful British brand, uh, although it has an incredible following internationally and, and reach at the same time. Really excited to talk to you, Will, because like me, you've been with your organisation for a very long time. So you've seen it grow from somewhat small beginnings into the incredible place that it is today in terms of the people, but also the success that you've had. And I know that that success is intrinsically linked with, um, I guess, how what I would describe as doing good. So you, you've got a lot of efforts in the organisation uh, to make the world better in some way. And also, I know you do a lot of stuff personally. So the values that you have and the values that the organisation have are very much aligned. So thank you again for joining us. And I would love to um, ask you a few questions. And I'm going to kick off by asking you um, to tell us a little bit more about the vision for Brompton Bikes. And also, I know you talk a lot about planet and society, making city living better for life and people. So tell us a bit about how that's reflected in what you do in the brand. So when we were little, and there were about 30 of us, when I first got involved in Brompton uh, 2002, we didn't need to write down what we were doing because it was just implicit and we were so busy you know, knee deep in trying to sort of make steps forward. But when you get bigger, um, you need to remind everybody and, and they need to have a sort of stake in the ground. So we went off with a friend of mine to go and do, we started writing poetry and cycling around weird parts of London. The whole thing was completely bonkers. And then we had to come together and try and come up with this, which was in us, but how do we define it? And I thought, oh, this is a joke. And is it really going to work and everything else? And anyway, uh, it, we came out, and this was back in about 2010, something like that. We came out with We Create Urban Freedom for Happier Lives. And that's what we've been doing up until that point, but we hadn't managed to sort of articulate it. And that is what we do. You know, we're just trying to make cities a little bit happier. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. And um, give, me a, give me a sense of the things that you're you know, sort of proudest about in terms of the internal culture and how you've, like, I was really interested to hear you talk in a very personal sense about the time that you spend on the floor with everyone and having done, in a sense, sort of every job, you're, you've got an engineering background, so you know exactly how things are built, you know how the company needs to be run, you know what the vision is, you can be everywhere and do a little bit of everything. So tell me how that translates into the, the kind of culture of the place and, and and how you try and make it what it is. I mean, and it is a, when, when you're, again, I keep going back to when you're little, but when you're little, you are working, you are needy, you are doing stuff. And then you discover that as the company gets bigger, you really have to do nothing. I mean, you don't really have any budget. You don't really have a job. It's all a bit weird. And, um, but your job, is to set the tone, to set the ambition, the vision, the culture. And um, and actually, it's hard to be honest and true because most businesses aren't. They're just steeped in politics and bullshit and allowing people to be themselves, recognising that we recruit people and we spend ages trying to find cool people because they actually have stuff we don't have, either in their skills or their experience. So you, when you bring them in, you've got to allow them to implement that. You can't tell them what to do, because otherwise all you'd be doing is staying in the same place. You've got to tell them what we're trying to achieve, what the vision is, and now you join our company, bring all your experience, your knowledge, and apply it to make us better and to bring new ideas and different ways of doing things. And everyone talks about that. But naturally, and we're bringing in people from big businesses that that don't think like that. Mm -hmm. So really standing up and allowing people to be themselves in their absolute most weird, wonderful way and apply that to our business and reminding people it's it's about impact. If we get mm -hmm. that right, the money, the, the ability to make profit, to invest and have a bigger impact all follows. But mm -hmm. impact is about the staff, how they feel, the customer, how we look after them, the rest follows in between, in behind. It's so obvious, but but actually not that many companies really do it. So being there and reinforcing that from the first induction and every touch point I have with our staff is sort of super important. Mm. Oh, I totally agree. And I love that you use the weird and wonderful phrase. That's one we use an awful lot of Wolf Olins as well. Um, 
but tell me things often get like life can get in the way of really being able to deliver that and uh and I just wondered if there's any lessons that you have that have helped you kind of stay true to that in some way that we'd all benefit from well I was maybe fortunate or unfortunate but when I was younger I did spend quite a lot of time trying to sort of put myself into difficult situations I got myself into terrible trouble in the Amazon <clears throat> climb mountains and you know we were all okay but people did die while we were on the mountain and so things got a bit scary when I was young a totally self-inflicted and in most cases my own fault but um it puts things into perspective mm. and that's what you need in business half the problem with business is people take it way too seriously and they get stressed and they work way too many hours and they start, you know, bitching about people because it's the most important thing in the world. It's not. It simply is not. There are things happening in the world right under our nose with friends, family, you know, challenges, health. There are things going on, you know, that we see in the news that are just tragic. So actually what we're doing isn't that important. And being able to, to put it into perspective actually allows you to do a far better job and realize you can say, right, I've done my bit. I've done as best I can. I'll leave it till tomorrow because I'm not going to keep flogging it. And our customers, if we're honest, they respect that. If we're trying our best, if we're really meaning to do our best, we won't be perfect. We'll get things wrong, but be honest about it. We're all human beings. We're not this perfect little brand that's all shiny and polished and we hide all the real bits un underneath. I think the the consumer's bored of that. They've seen too much of that in politics, too much of that in brands that portray the shiny image and then they're doing nasty things to the environment or nasty things to their supply chain. And just a bit of real honesty helps and, and perspective. Yeah, yeah, I totally hear you. And how do you... <clears throat> how do you balance that with with growing so i i i ask this in quite a personal sense because i've been part of uh, my company for a long time and i've known it when it was very small and mm. i've known it when it's grown quite a lot and you go through um different transitions and phases as you described one haven't you already in terms of you can't just assume everybody knows you have to start talking to to, to everyone in a different way to make sure that everyone really does know in some way and, and can um, you know can tell others so tell me about some of the transitions that you've been through and maybe some of the ones that have been interesting lesson wise so I think the first thing you have to do is believe mm. you need to set an ambitious goal I mean as I said I've climbed mountains Everyone needs to really want to climb that mountain. And it's no good saying you're going to climb a mountain because they might all shoot up different mountains. You're never going to get to the top. You're all going to know which mountain you're going for and you want to get to the top. That might take 50 years. You know, it's not like some short term will get us knock, knocked on the head in six months. Mm. But if your team believe in that, genuinely believe in that striving for that ultimate goal, and ours is about, impact on how people live in cities if they believe in that you don't need to ask them to work hard because they will work too hard that if they believe in something and care for it they will work hard too hard often and that's a problem i find people put themselves in harm's way because they are working too hard so i've never found it a problem we have to make people work harder that just doesn't exist mm. and then beyond that it's about giving them the tools to fulfill their potential, clearing the bureaucracy, believing them and empowering them, allowing them to take risk, but and just ensuring that we're all pointing in the right direction and we all are actually going to climb the same mountain. But but getting people to work has never been a problem. And on that journey, there are times when our business is not growing or where our profit goes backwards. I'm not that bothered. As long as we don't run out of cash, you know, turnover is vanity, profit insanity, cash is queen. Long as we don't run out of cash, it's fine. And people like, oh, what are we going to do next quarter? What are we going to do next this year? I'm not bothered about that. Are we doing stuff to get us to the next level, which is in three to five years? And are we laying the foundations culturally for five to 10? So sometimes 
you've got to actually ignore the numbers as long as the business is safe because you know that underneath you're doing some deep foundational stuff that will give you the springboard for growth and we've grown about 20 percent a year compound for 20 years that's warren buffett that's how you need to think mm. sustainable compound growth and that's ebbs and flows but if you get too caught up in this year's numbers you'll make short-term bad decisions mm. Which is the quarterly cycle that you hear so much about, isn't it? If you have mm. very, um, uh, in, in interested shareholders in... Um, Correct. And that's yeah. where, I mean, we have shareholders and we're owned by the inventor and his mates, me and my mates and our staff. Um, but I'd say to all of them, you're not important. The number one is our purpose, to create urban freedom for happier lives. That's what we're going to do. And to do that, we need to care about the customer. We need to have great staff. We need to have suppliers that believe in us. And if we get all that right, if we actually deliver urban freedom and happiness, you don't have to worry about your value. That'll come. Mm. But that is, it comes out the back of it. Let's never put that first because that's when you start making these short-term bad decisions. Mm. Do you think you need longevity of leadership to be able to properly see that through? I think you need the right ownership. So mm -hmm. the, the, the ownership structure really matters, which is why I think PE and VC, certainly for a company like ours, is bad because then just don't have a long enough view, in my opinion. They're, they're interested in, you know, five to seven years if you're lucky and then an exit. And I really feel that's bad for business. I don't know enough about service industries, but for manufacturing, forget it, it's bad. I think then... Leadership, I think, can change, but I think that we have this weird culture in, well, in the world that you might work for a company for eight years, you might give it your all, and the day you leave, you literally walk out the door, never to be seen again. You go on to your next job, and it's just like, and there's all this talk about handover, and there's all this, you know, I'll chat to the next, never happens. That strikes me as a bit odd to lose that insight. So we've tried quite hard when people come to the end of their career to actually retain them inside the business and to, to allow them to continue to work inside the business for five, eight years in a different capacity as their career trajectory comes to an end. And that results initially in job role change, but then working hours might go down to three days a week. But to me, having that continuity of experience, understanding, while still allowing new people to come in and drive with energy for change, I think works. I think if you um, if you just lob off the experience and go too heavy for the new, you, you put yourself at risk. Mm, mm, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, anyone else you think is doing a particularly good job? Do you know, it's, it's terrible. Um, I don't, I'm not a sort of fan really um i mean i i think i don't endlessly you know look at other businesses and think wow how can we be like them I, I i sort of tend to just think there's so many things we're doing that it's so obviously not good enough you know we're just riddled in low-hanging fruit because the business keeps reinventing itself and then we might have been quite good at a 50 million pound turnover we haven't got a clue what we're doing at 130 and we've introduced all these new silly things um, and even things we were good at at 50, we then become bad at at 100 million because then the communication gets harder and we're not so good at it. So we, you know, so you can't even rely on something you were good at to retain that capability. But I do, I mean, I like, even though Warren Buffett's a peculiar chap, I'm a great fan of compound growth. And, um, and I always really embed that into the thinking in our organization commercially. I have to say what Dyson's achieved is pretty breathtaking as a, as a leader i'm quite a different person to him but my god makes me think god what have we been doing how have we only got to 130 million look what they've done i mean it makes you think my god if they can do that we can do that come on mm -hmm. so and then you know there are lots of businesses and there is obviously b corp and a movement globally around this idea that planet earth and the people that live in it we, we can't continue if all business does is make shareholders rich and they don't care about anything else. That's just not possible. We're going we're gonna to shoot ourselves in the fit. We become Easter Island of global Easter Island. It's so stupid. 
And the great thing is the consumer, who's the most powerful person of all, is mm. finally realizing they don't want to buy stuff from companies that are nasty, that only care about shareholders and that are doing damage to, to them and future generations behind them. So, you know, that movement is admirable. And there are lots of great examples of businesses that are, that are jumping into that. In, and, and we can learn from them in many different ways. Mm. And I think it's those businesses reaching scale that becomes very inspiring because there's a lot of arguments around who's buying cheaper goods and why they do because mm. everybody is in a fortunate position to do otherwise. And so once once businesses are able to reach a, a scale of some kind, as well as a mindset change amongst consumers more generally, so that the prices are in a place where everyone can participate, it gets a lot easier, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think you need to. There's a there is a difference between price and value, mm -hmm. and I think we need to reconsider what value is, mm -hmm. because value is longevity, is built to last, is repairable, sustainable, um, delightful, emotionally rich. So, and I think. The, the consumer need, needs and is becoming more sophisticated to not necessarily look at price, but look at value. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to offer is insane value. Mm -hmm. And if something makes you happy and lasts 30 or 40 years and means that you might live longer, means that on a daily basis, you know, your heart rises because you're in the environment, you see something, you're not stuffed under the ground, shoved into a little metal tube. I mean, it's just... A delight and you know i i just want more people to get on bikes because it just makes you happy such a no-brainer i've loved talking to you will and i feel very i've come away feeling very inspired i'm terrible on a bike like a liability but i've got one downstairs so i think i might get it out and give it give it another go <laughs> you really you know you, you the thing is you can start slowly start in a park and what you realize is the city's full of wonderful cycle lanes that are safe where you can wobble about and be fine. And you don't need to jump into nasty traffic. There are loads of places to cycle. And it 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 just makes you happy. And that's that's good. <laughs>